Chapter Twelve of the Directory of the Devout Life by F. B. Meyer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter Twelve, Perfect as God, Matthew Chapter Five, Verses Forty-Three to Forty-Eight. In the garden, the serpent suggested to our first parents that they should be as God, in knowing good and evil. But the Master tells us that we are to be as God in the character and temper of our inner life. If his words here are compared with the parallel ones in Luke chapter 6, we discover that he desires us to resemble our Heavenly Father, not in our knowledge, which would, of course, be impossible, but in our love and mercy. The perfection on which he insists is a perfection of love. Our natures are, of course, limited in extent and shallow in depth as compared to the ocean fullness of the infinite god but a cup may be in its measure as brimming full as an ocean when the tide is high up to our measure we may become as full of love as in his far greater measure our father is and that is what christ demands when he says be ye therefore perfect even as your father which is in heaven is perfect This is the fifth illustration which he gives, that he has come not to destroy, but to fulfill the law, by shedding abroad in our hearts that love which is the fulfilling of that law. And it is interesting to notice exactly the change which he wrought in the ancient code. The precept which our Lord quotes, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy, cannot be found in the Old Testament. On the contrary, its pages are strewn with the most moving exhortations to love. If any of my readers would take the pains to investigate the matter, they would be startled to find the numerous exhortations to love which are scattered through the ancient code, generally considered so rigorous and severe. If, said Moses, thou meet thine enemy's ox or his ass going astray, thou shalt surely bring it back to him again. And again, if thou see the ass of him that hateth thee lying under his burden, wouldst thou forbear to help him? Thou shalt surely help with him. Exodus chapter 23, verses 4 and 5. In a later age the same kindly spirit appears in the injunction of the preacher. Rejoice not when thine enemy falleth, and let not thine heart be glad when he stumbleth, lest the Lord see it, and it displease him. When, therefore, our Lord said, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. He did not mean to refer to the inspired teachers of his people, but to those later rabbis and scribes who had overlaid the pure gold of Moses with their own incrustations. There were two ways in which the teachers of the corrupt periods of Hebrew history had vitiated the scope of these ancient laws. First, they had obliterated the words, As thyself and whittled down the precept from thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself to thou shalt love thy neighbor next they had out of their own bad hearts added the words and hate thine enemy lowering the word of god to suit their own tradition was it not high time that the moss and grit of centuries should be removed from the ancient characters which the spirit of god had cut in the legislation of sinai and that Christ should re-edit the old law, doing away with the hateful additions, and enlarging the significance of that word, neighbor. They had delighted in limiting it. He rejoiced to level the walls of religious bigotry, jealousy, and national exclusivism, and taught that our neighbor is simply any one to whom we can show kindness, so that the word stands for the universal brotherhood of man. Our Lord desires that we should show love and kindness not only to man as man, but equally to our enemies as to our friends, and to those that curse, hate, and despitefully use us, as to those who will sacrifice everything on our behalf. To enable us to realize such a command, he suggests the inspiration of a great nature, a great example, and a great hope. 1. We need the inspiration of a great nature. Sons of your Father which is in heaven. Sons of the highest. Luke chapter 6 verse 35. Men count much on ancestry. To be connected, however distantly, 
with the great of bygone times, is a subject of never-ceasing congratulation. To be able to point to some tomb where the cross-legged effigy on the stone denotes the Knight Templar, or the shell indicates the pilgrim who crossed the seas on the Crusades, is a prouder boast than wealth and lands. To wear a coat of arms which proves royal affinity, ah, how much is this? And there is ground for it, because descent and blood undoubtedly count for something. When the special call comes, there is something in heredity that answers it. How much, then, must it not count for, when we stand face to face with urgent duty, that the capacity for its due discharge is certainly within us by virtue of our relationship to God through Jesus Christ? We have been born again by the Word and the Spirit. From the family of the first Adam we have become grafted into the family of the second. We are all the children of God by faith in Him, and if children then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And because we are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts. Since, then, we are partakers of the divine nature, we have within us the capacity for divine love. We may not be aware of its presence within us, but it is there, and if only we would dare to give it exercise, and allow it to make for itself an outlet in our kindly advances towards those who have served us ill, we should find that through the channels of outward expression the very fountains of divine love which are within us would pour their crystal tides. You can love as God, not in quantity, but in quality, because God's own nature has been begotten in you, and awaits the opportunity of approving itself before men and angels. 2. But we need, also, the inspiration of a great example. Who is there that has not sometimes stood on the mountain of transfiguration with Moses and Elias? A visit from some celestial nature, a biography, a noble act, a reunion which has revealed depths and emotion that surpass all previous experiences, these have greatly influenced our lives, and made us resolve that life should henceforth be new. And so our Lord brings us face to face with a marvelous illustration of the love which He desires us to show. Of course, he himself, as he sat there, was the supreme instance of God's impartial love. But the time had not arrived when he could speak plainly of himself, so he selected his example from the humbler book of nature, which he often studied in his highland home, and which lies open before all men's eyes. It was the month of April. Before his eyes was spread a charming landscape, on which probably the natural incidents to which he referred were at that moment taking place. From its meridian throne the sun was shining. It was the Father's sun. He maketh his sun to shine. It was his thought, his creation, the instrument of his benediction. See, said the Master, how the sun is shining on the children as they play their merry games, and at the same moment on the prison filled with hardened criminals, on the casement of the cottage, to revive the sick girl's drooping life, and on the path of the poor fallen one, as she avoids it, and steals into the shade, upon the little patch of ground belonging to the poor widow, which barely affords her a living, and on the acres of the avaricious tyrant, who cares neither for God nor man, and would despoil her of her holding if he could. The sun shines equally on them all. Then the master may have pointed towards the heavy rain-cloud, born from the Mediterranean, which came trailing over the country, dropping its beneficent showers from its impartial buckets. Yonder lie two fields, with but a narrow fence between. That to the right belongs to an atheist of the worst type, who blasphemes God's name, underpays his servants, robs the widow, and browbeats the poor." That to the left is the holding of one who is as careful of his religious observances as the other is careless. The swift shadow of the cloud draws near. If it were steered by a human hand, it would probably be guided so as to leave the one untouched whilst it poured its stores on the other. But there is no shade of difference in the distribution. The abundant and refreshing showers fall on either side of the fence. Life is like an April day. It is not all sun, nor all cloud. 
The saddest lives have some patches of blue, some hours of sun. The happiest have some showers, and are overspread now and again with shadow. And surely this is best, for those characters are not the noblest which are spent always on the tableland, and never descend into the valley of shadow. For, son, you have had love at home, a happy childhood, a loving wife, sweet children, prosperous years in business, long spells of good health, happy episodes, weeks and months of country or sea. For rain, you have had seasons of ill health, of business anxiety, and of bereavement. Now, if we were to compare experiences between the men and women of our acquaintance in the same position of life, putting away all considerations of the inner peace of heart which religion gives, I do not suppose that in the outward life there would be much apparent difference. There are thousands of homes where God's name is not honored, but where goodness and mercy, like guardian angels, follow the inmates all the days of their lives. Why? Because the course of events in this world moves by blind machinery? No. Because God has no special care whether a man be good or bad? No. But because God loves his enemies, blesses those that curse him, and is kind to the unthankful and unloving. If anything, he seems more bountiful to those who oppose him most, that by his mercy he may lead them to repentance. A man will sometimes speak thus, I am one of the luckiest fellows living, all my dreams have been realized, I have a good wife, have not had an hour's illness, and have never wanted for money. Such men do not realize that it is God who has given them all things richly to enjoy, making no distinction between them and his dearest children, because he longs to break in upon their shameful neglect of his claims. He gives rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with good and gladness, that we may turn from vanity unto the living God, which made heaven and earth, and the sea, and all things that are therein. Acts chapter 14 Verses 15 to 17. We might, from the experience of these men, edit a new edition of the parable of the prodigal on this wise, that when the father in the distant home heard that his son had spent all that he had, instead of letting him come down to the herding of pigs and the eating of their husks, he sent him day by day supplies of sumptuous food, on each hamper of which these words were inscribed, I love thee still. Come home. Haste to come home. But God has given us another and better son than that which he has hung in heaven's porch. He commendeth his love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And the benefits of the death of the Redeemer are for the world. Therefore it was possible to carry the gospel, in the first instance, to Jerusalem, the men who had used him most despitefully lived there. Therefore the master bade his disciples to begin at Jerusalem. Tell Caiaphas, who sneered at my royalty, that I love him. Tell the gray-haired Annas, the irresolute Pilate, and the mocking Herod, that I desire to bless them. Go and find out the men who drove the nails into my hands and laughed at my dying anguish, and say that I will pray for them. So the Master left us an example, that we should follow in his steps. And God has given another and better rain than that which fertilizes the fields, the rain of the Holy Spirit's influence and grace, which is for the most stubborn and obdurate offenders. Did he not descend in copious effusion upon the city of Jerusalem at the first, though it had but lately crucified the world's Redeemer? Take heart, you who think that you have grieved him away, who have done him despite, who fear that you have committed the unpardonable sin, even to you he comes with a shower of grace, falling with refreshing bounty. This is the example that we are to follow. Nothing less than God's even-handed love is to be our model. We are to be perfect, even as our Heavenly Father is perfect. We are called to be imitators of God, as dear children, walking in love, as Christ also hath loved us, even to the point of giving himself for us. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Anything short of this is not Christianity as our Lord taught it. 
Dr. Abbott has said that he remembers, when he was a boy, sitting by the fireside of a little country inn in Maine, and hearing some men discuss the Sermon on the Mount. They were rough fellows, and one of them, scoffing at Christianity, said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor. Nonsense. It is not in human nature. Exactly. Such love is not in human nature. Men love those who love them, and salute their brethren, and stop there. But it was in Christ's nature, and it is in the divine nature. And it is in the divine nature to be imparted through Christ to those who claim it. 3. We require, lastly, the inspiration of a great hope. What animates a woman to spend her life on some brutal husband or ungrateful son? Is it not the hope that, at last, her love will conquer? And is it not this, in an infinitely higher sphere, that leads God, our Father, to pour out the ceaseless tides of his heart on the disobedient and rebellious? Does he not see the consummation, when the heavens and the earth shall have become new as the result of his unstinted love? And ought not the same purpose to animate us? It is recorded of a certain Chinese emperor that, on being apprised that his enemies had raised an insurrection in a distant province, he said to his officers, Come, follow me, and we shall quickly destroy them. On his arrival the rebels submitted to him, and all expected that he would take the most signal revenge. Instead of this, the captives were treated with the utmost humanity. How, cried his first minister of state, is this the manner in which your promise is fulfilled? Your royal word was given that your enemies should be destroyed, and, lo, you have pardoned them all, and even some of them have been caressed. I promised, said the emperor generously, to destroy my enemies. I have fulfilled my word, for, see, their enemies no longer. I have made friends of them. We must henceforth amend our ways, lest we be counted not worthy of Christ. We must rise to the level of his high demands, not in our own strength, but his. And let us remember two things. First, not to wait for an emotion, but to obey by the sheer power of our will. And second, to begin with individuals. Have we an enemy who is always trying to curse us? We must be willing to bless him with the benediction of our good will. Is there someone in our life who envies and hates us? We must be willing to be kind and good, so long as we are sure that our behavior is not misinterpreted, or hurtful to his independence and moral life. Is there one who despitefully uses and persecutes us? We must compel ourselves to pray for him, until presently a warm feeling of compassion fills our hearts. Are there within our reach curlish and bearish people? Let us salute them when we meet with Christian courtesy and grace. Thus you will reach perfection. It will not be the absolute and infinite perfection of God, for at the best it can be only relative and finite. It will not be the perfection of angels, for they have never left their first estate. It will not be a perfection of knowledge, for we are all liable to err. It will not be freedom from temptation, or from such infirmities as weakness of body, dullness of understanding, and incoherence of thought. But it will be, after your measure, a full-orbed, equable, and loving nature, which shall go through the world shedding sunshine and rain on weary and hopeless souls, until they be led to take up heart and hope again. A little child gets into a railway carriage. In perfect simplicity she begins to play with some austere-looking man, until he relaxes, and the two become friends, and from them the genial warmth steals through the carriage, until everyone begins to talk kindly with his neighbor, and the tedium of the journey is relaxed. Oh, to go through the world like that, with God's radiance on our faces and his love in our hearts. Every day, be sunshine or rain to someone, especially to your enemies and the people from whom you are naturally repelled. You say that all this is impossible for you. It is high. You cannot attain unto it. But remember those sweet old words. When Israel was a child, then I loved him, and called my son out of Egypt. I taught Ephraim also to go. 
Hosea chapter 11, verses 1 to 3. Ask your Heavenly Father to teach you to go, to put His Spirit within you as the fountain of His life and love, to work in you to will and to do of His good pleasure. Everything lies in the will. Are you willing that His will should be done in and through you in respect to the life of love of which we have been treating? If so, then yield yourself to Him, saying, I cannot be perfect in love unless thou dost undertake to realize in me and through me the image of thine own perfection. End of chapter 12